Jackson scar. What is shirt? No Russell that way. That's great. All right. All good. All good. Sounds good. Not too low. Okay. Ready to go? Yes, indeed. Welcome, everybody. Aloha from Hawaii and Kia ora from New Zealand, and welcome from Washington, D.C. My name is Amanda Ellis. I am with the Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability at Arizona State <coughs> University, and also delighted to have been recently appointed a professor of practice with Thunderbird. I am thrilled to be back here in my old haunt. I was at the World Bank from 2003 to 2010, and always use the opportunity when I'm back in town to get together incredibly intelligent and wonderful women and men who are going to change the world. So we're thrilled to be co-hosting the event today with Professor Anne Farini from the Thunderbird Global School of Management. And our topic today is why women leaders are so important for women's economic empowerment. And we have two fabulous keynote speakers, Laura Liswood, who is the founder and secretary general of the Council for Women World Leaders, and with whom I've had the privilege of just being in Iceland, where we have been uh, at the Reykjavik Global Forum, uh, hosted, among others, by the Prime Minister, uh, who is uh, quite an impressive young woman. And Laura had a meeting of the Council, so I think we had seven women heads of state, current and past, who were with us, and around 500 women at the Forum. And following Laura will be Pia Trumbuk, who is the program manager for Women, Business and the Law at the World Bank Group and is doing fantastic work. I, way back when, uh, started the project at the World Bank and have just been thrilled to see the brilliant women that have taken it on and taken it to new heights. And Atia has just gone through the last round of reforms, so you will be getting the latest hot off the presses. We're then going to have an interactive discussion where we're going to invite Cynthia and Gwen to join us along with Anne up here and have a moderated discussion. Next year, as you know, 2020, Watershed Year for Women's Progress, the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Platform for Women, the 20th anniversary for the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security, and as a sidebar, when I was ambassador to the UN, while New Zealand served on the Security Council. I was co-chair for humanitarian access into Syria and found that resolution extremely important. So uh, personal sidebar, but thrilled that next year we'll mark that. And of course, the 10th anniversary of UN Women. So a very big year. And we'll be talking later about a global coalition that along with Laura and others, like the Interparliamentary Union and the uh, Women Political Leaders Forum, we are putting together to really ensure that women's equality under the law becomes a reality. Just before I introduce Anne, little quiz. Anyone know how many countries in the world have achieved gender equality in practice? Zero from the back. Yes, zero. Exactly, most unfortunately. Anyone know how many countries, and I should ask Tia this question because it may have changed since last year. How many countries still have laws that discriminate against women under the law? All of them? No, it's better than that. And Tia is going to tell us. She's smiling, that Mona Lisa smile. So Tia, are you going to tell us or are we going to have to wait for the presentation? So we are making progress then because it was only six that had gender equality until very recently. So. In the very few things better. Okay, so we will look forward to that. But I'd like to invite my co-host, Professor Anne Farini, to come and speak. Anne has an amazing CV, so I've just picked out three tiny little things. She was a senior fellow at Brookings here in DC, and then was headhunted to go to Singapore, where she started with two different universities, a global management programs, and then was brought back here by Chanji Chagrin, the Dean of Thunderbird to do the same thing for ASU here in DC. So Anne, it's wonderful to be a partner in crime and uh, thank you very much for co-hosting. Thank you, Amanda. I appreciate that. Really, thank you so much for the public event. Thank you, Amanda. 
The second time so to speak, and back and forth, the program manager for Thunderbird here in Washington, who put this together in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Along with the rather extraordinary building staff, IT staff that ASU has here, for all of you who work in any kind of organization, you know that those people are the ones upon whom your life depends, and we are very grateful to have you all here for everything that you have to do. Um, I can talk about this a little later, but I do want to mention the program that Thunderbird is launching in January here because we have five or six applicants to that program here in the audience. Um, Thunderbird has a very different approach to management and the management of global affairs than your standard business school and policy school. We are interested in helping people achieve the skills and the knowledge and the networks that are necessary to solve the big problems like gender equality and all of the other things that are covered by the if you're interested in knowing more about what it is we're doing, a mid-career executive master's program, and every other Friday and Saturday schedule, we have flyers in the back. Jenny and I would be happy to talk to you more about the program and how it operates. Because the people who care about the kinds of subjects we are here to hear about today are the kinds of people we are looking for in our program. But mostly thank you to Amanda for making it possible for us to join forces on this. We just got started. Thunderbird just got started in Washington a few months ago. This is our first event. Oh, <laughs> and it's very modest, but Thunderbird is ranked number one globally for the master's program too, which is no mean feat. And I was just thrilled to find out that ASU is number one in innovation in the US ahead of Stanford and MIT now for the fifth year in a row. And it was very, very fun. I, seeing Michael Crow introduce the Dean of MIT, who he introduced as having gone to the second most innovative school, which was Stanford, and being the Dean of the third most innovative school, and being awarded a doctorate from the most innovative school. So I think this new inclusive approach to education and to ensuring that all of us can bring our collective power to making positive, practical change in the world is so refreshing. So the idea of inclusion with innovation and practical impact is one that I'm very excited to be part of. So with that, welcome everybody, and it's now my great pleasure to invite Laura Liswood, the Secretary General of the Council of Women World Leaders, to come and share some of her extraordinary journey with you. This woman has been a mentor and a role model of mine for many years, and is somebody who absolutely makes things happen. Friends and old friends here, which is nice. So uh, first off, uh, can you hear me okay? okay? So Amanda asked me to talk a little bit about first the formation of this council uh, that I run and then perhaps some observations that I have around these issues of economic empowerment, the value of women as leaders, etc. And I think you'll have a very good uh, uh, presentation from Tia, Tia about the, uh, uh, the issues and the impacts of laws and then looking forward to the conversation with people like Glenn here, and Cynthia and others around this. So look at the council was started, um, I often characterize it as uh, what I call one of those in the shower questions. We all have them. Uh, generally speaking, they should stay in the shower. Uh, but this was, was, what would it be like to have a woman president in the United States? Not such an arbitrary question because the research from the Center for American Women in Politics had identified, had done some quantitative research on women state legislators. It was the first quantitative study I'd ever seen. Everything else had been qualitative and anecdotal. And uh, so it showed that because there were a sufficient number of women state legislators to analyze this, and I, I suspect, Cynthia, you have some more of this kind of data now. Uh, that it did indicate that women legislated differently than men at the state level. They introduced different bills, they interacted with their constituents differently, uh, they handled uh, committee sessions differently, et cetera. So I thought, whoa, this is interesting. So hypothesizing what would, be, what would it be like if we had a woman president? What might change? 
if we have that. Uh, and so uh, I thought, well, who can I ask in the United States about this question? Nobody. And that continues, unfortunately, to this day. But at the time, there were 15 women living who had been or were then president or prime minister of their country. And uh, I decided for some unknown reason to think that I could meet a few of them. Totally unknown reason, which was I'm not from CNN, right? And <laughs> But I went about asking for these interviews. And for all the, the women who are just starting out on their career, the first uh, recommendation I will give to you is that if you don't ask for something, the answer is always no. Right? But if you do ask for something, it could be no, but it could be yes. And so cut to the chase of the 15 women, both current and formers. Um, after 18 months, I'd actually met them all. Uh, so I'm the only person who's actually ever met all of these women leaders. And not one of the women leaders turned me down for an interview. Uh, well, Margaret Thatcher said, come back after you've met everyone else. <laughs> Which actually, because I'm an experiential learner, I was eternally grateful I'd met 14 other prime ministers before I got to Margaret Thatcher, because uh, I needed all the practice I could get with her. Um, she was quite interesting, not the gender feminist in the crowd uh, by any means, uh, but uh, she was quite, uh, she did exhibit a trait of leadership that I have found of uh, leaders, uh, is that she was enormously curious, interested very much in uh, having, knowing what the other leaders had said in response to my questions. My interview was scheduled for a half an hour with her. I was with her for about three and a half hours to answering this, well, Took about an hour to get through the Falklands, but you know, <laughs> whatever. I had to listen to that. Um, anyway, uh, but um, she was curious. And the others were curious, too, because, again, I'm the only one who has met them all. And what happens, I often observe of women. Glenn, I don't know if you would you know, substantiate this, this comment, but um, if you don't have another woman to ask about something happening to you, you know, and you begin to think it's something wrong with you. That's kind of pathological to you. I don't know, do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, but it's like, okay, there must be something wrong with me. You think it's you or you think it's your gender almost immediately, exactly. And the, 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 the really difficult part is if you think it's you, you begin to erode your own sense of confidence in yourself. You know, so it was actually quite, I think, relieving, if you will, to these leaders that when they would express a problem that they had or something, um, I would say to a prime minister, ah, prime minister, don't worry. Prime minister so-and-so had the exact same problem. You know, there was a little therapy after a while. But uh, the, um, and so my interviews were getting longer and longer as they were asking me what the others had said. So I finally uh, did ask them if they wanted to meet each other. They said they did. So we had a summit uh, with CSIS in Stockholm where most of them came. And uh, they agreed to create a council of themselves. And uh, Mary Robinson had chaired the summit, and she asked Vigdis, President Vigdis of Iceland, first woman president in the, of the world, in the, in the world, uh, to uh, be the first chair of it. And so we ended up housing the council and ended up being secretary general of it. So it's a journey I had no idea I would end up taking in that sense. And we housed the council at the Kennedy School of Government, thanks to Joe Nye the dean of the school there. And I would be reminded, and perhaps some of you have heard me say this before, but I would be reminded of why we were doing this work literally every day. Because I'd walk by a quote embedded in a granite slab at the John F. Kennedy Park. And it was a quote from John F. Kennedy. And I'd read it every day. And it said, when at some future date, the high court of history sits in judgment of each, of each one of us, our success or failure in whatever office we hold will be measured by the answers to four questions. Were we truly men of courage? Were we truly men of dedication? Were we truly men of integrity? Were we truly men of judgment? And I'd read that every day. And I'd think to myself, such good questions to ask men. <laughs> But of course, it's good questions to ask women too. Right? But as we have known in history, uh, men have been the historic archetype of what a leader looks like. Uh, so just in terms of the council, the council itself is we spent seven years at the uh, Kennedy School and seven years at the Aspen Institute, and now we're seven years here at the UN Foundation. 
uh, which has been a good home for us. And the council is basically how it runs. It's a, it's a, it's a self-governing entity because unlike other head of state organizations that you may know of that aren't treaty-based organizations where there is made up of uh, former heads of state, this one has both current and former heads of state. So we have all the current sitting heads of state as members and almost all the formers. Uh, so what happens is if a woman is freely elected head of state or head of government in their country, uh, we will, the chair, will invite them to join the council. Uh, we'll wait about three months uh, to make sure they stick, that they don't all stick <laughs> as heads of state. You know, sometimes they're in and out. Uh, and then we'll invite them to join the council. And then they choose to join or not. But because we have all the sitting heads of state, all the sitting heads of state always join, uh, always join them. So we currently have um, 76 members of the council. Uh, most recent member addition was the prime minister of Denmark who just uh, became prime minister of Denmark, uh, refusing to sell you know, Greenland. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> put a woman in that job. She won't, she won't sell her country. <laughs> and uh, so you know, we continue to grow as women become, uh, get, get elected to the office. I will tell you, interestingly, the number of sitting he women heads of state never goes above about 12 at any one moment in time which is kind of an interesting phenomenon, you know, because they're coming and going. But at any one time, you probably aren't going to get more than 12, maybe 15 at most. So and that's just kind of an interesting phenomenon. About a third of women to this day uh, come to their power, their position of power, often through some sort of legacy. Either their husbands or fathers have been assassinated, or their husbands or fathers uh, have been in the office, uh, and then they follow them in that, in that office. Uh, most of them, interestingly enough, which was surprising to me, have invariably had someone in their family who was involved in politics uh, before they came into the office. Uh, so they had a familiarity with the position itself, or the familiarity with politics. You know, even uh, Margaret Thatcher's uh, father was the mayor of a little town that she came from. Uh, so that, and I, I actually call that the Uncle Fred theory, uh, which is if Uncle Fred the idiot can do it, I can do it. <laughs> yeah, you have to have really important political science terms for these things. You know, I just think it's really important as a researcher to, to have that. Uh, also, you will sometimes find uh, that, and I don't know if this is true, Cynthia, in the United States by state, or you know, uh, is that a woman will put be voted into office during a crisis. Uh, I don't know if you see that, if you've had that from your perspective. Well, people design crisis. Yeah. Who? who? Uh, elections in 2018, the midterms. Yes. Yeah. Where, where you're creating the crisis. So you, you see someone like an Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, uh, former president of Liberia, comes into her, her, her position after the country's been through crisis. You'll often see, you know, again, a woman is in the position after someone has been assassinated. There's a crisis, a financial crisis, or something like that. And part of it is uh, that. If you are a member of the historically out of power group, which all women are, uh, you uh, always, always represent change. Because if you're in the historically in power group, you don't represent change. If you're from the historically out of power group, you always represent change. And therefore, during a crisis, people are looking for change. And so they'll do that. Of course, again, uh, the uh, scientific term for that is the crumbling cliff theory, uh, which is just as the cliff is crumbling, they go, oh, well, let's try a woman now. <laughs> of course, the problem with that is it is a crisis, and often she will fail because of the crisis, not because of her leadership capacity, but because of what's going on in the country. And often then people say, well, you know, we tried this woman, and it sure didn't work, so we're going to go back to dominant group members, forgetting the fact that many of those dominant group members failed a lot. Yeah, created, <laughs> and created the crisis themselves. Uh, so, you know, that's, it's been... It's been interesting. All of the women, it, to this day, you'd think after just 20 years, but to this day, they still say they're over-scrutinized uh, for their dress, their style, their voice. Their, I mean, does that remind you of anything that happened before? Uh, the press, the, uh, their tolerance for mistakes is less for women than the tolerance for mistakes for men. Uh, they articulated all of these kinds of things. 
I think what was also interesting, though, is when the women came into power very, very often, um, they would, in fact, attempt, and successfully to some extent, bring more women into the positions, into the higher level positions, into the cabinet level positions. Um, and are you signaling me to, that I should quit? Oh. Uh, segue, yeah. because we are going to come back and have more of a discussion later, but as Laura says, more women coming into power actually then begins to change what happens from a legislative perspective. And I think yeah. that's the interesting piece that the research is now showing is that legislation, when there are more women in power, actually begins to favor the kinds of long-term growth drivers that women care about, like education and health and women's representation. So I think that's one of the mm. really interesting things that we're now beginning to see and why I was so keen to have you introduced today mm -hmm. before we, we heard the latest update on women, business, and the law. And then okay. we want to make sure that we get you back for Q&A with the audience. Okay, let me, uh, oh, very good, very good. Uh, yeah, you do see this, you know, that women will do that. And you see it in the panchayats in India, Esther Duflo's work about what happens when the women are in the villages yes, and where the budgets go and right. things like that. I'll just give you one further sort of d data point on this. Uh, but let me also say that I think we're, we're swimming in data. <laughs> yeah. We just have a lot of it. You know. And I'm not sure we actually know what to do with it to some extent or how to use it the best way. It, it, it's, uh, it's, it, uh, I don't quote Donald Rumsfeld, Donald Rumsfeld normally, uh, but uh, you know, he has this notion of the unknown knowns, which is something is known, but we pretend it's unknown. And I think the data will do that. But let me just give you one qu quick data uh, sort of showing of what happens, as Amanda says, when you get a critical mass of O's in a room full of X's. Okay, so that's literally what happens. And I think more of the research should focus on that. And this is the Norwegian experience uh, with Norwegian boards, as some of you are familiar with, with that. So let me just uh, to share you, with you some of the research on that. The Norwegian board situation is, is that uh, there's a law in Norway from about 15 years now that 40% of corporate board seats must be of the opposite gender. That's how the law reads. Uh, and if the public corporation doesn't get to 40%, and it basically means women, uh, it is uh, delisted from the Norwegian Stock Exchange and dissolved as a company. Yeah. And we think all of our, yeah, right. <laughs> we think all of our little things are you know, gonna make changes. No, you gotta delist and dissolve, and then maybe people will listen. Anyway, uh, most of the corporate boards have gotten to 40% women. Uh, they couldn't find any qualified women before the law. Amazing how quickly they found them after the law. Uh, but uh, what's been interesting is the research that's coming out about corporate board governance processes. That's the interesting thing about this. Not necessarily the financial results, although we could talk about that, but financial results are correlative, not causal. So it's a little more difficult to do that. Uh, but what they have found is uh, several things. One, they have discovered that the uh, women read the board materials. What can I tell you? Uh, <laughs> but what that means is, what they found is now the men are coming to the board having read the board materials. So what does that tell you? That tells you that the dominant group's performance improves in the very presence of the non-dominant group. Okay. That's what it tells wow. me. The second, um, uh, more of the board decisions are being made within the boardroom, not nightclub, golf course, country club, because these affirmative mechanisms break through in-group favoritism and close social networks, which are things that happen on the golf course. Third, they've discovered that women uh, ask more uh, difficult questions than men do. Uh, fourth, they've, they've, they've found that uh, 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 a men will have a tendency to look at the short-term impact of board decisions, women will have a tendency to look at the long-term impact of board decisions. Uh, best boards look at short-term and long-term. Uh, men will have a tendency to look at the uh, shareholder impact of board decisions. Women will have a tendency to look at the stakeholder impact of board decisions. Stakeholders, environments, employees, communities. Best boards, of course, look at shareholder and stakeholder. So it's a really interesting controlled experiment. Yeah. And I'll leave it at that, of what happens when you get a critical mass of O's in a room full of X's. So Fantastic. Thank yeah. you, Laura. Thank you so much. Laura, it's, it's a 
brilliant. And you will have an opportunity to interact with her uh, in the Q&A session. Now my great pleasure to introduce Tia Pumps, who is going to take us through the latest on women, business, and the law. Can you hear me? I need a microphone. Okay. Hello, and thank you. We are we are live. We oh, are okay. recording. She's good. Perfect. Okay, great. If I stay here. Okay. Thank you, Amanda, for inviting me. It's great to be here, and what a fantastic speaker to follow. I, I'm really impressed with all your research and ideas, and would love to follow up more uh, on what happens when there are more women in the room. Uh, the Women, Business, and the Law Report, I just wanted to get a quick show of hands. I know some of you know it very well. How many of you have not heard of this before? Oh, good. Okay, so there is used to telling you everything that's in my PowerPoint. Uh, I'll try to keep it brief because I know that we don't have a lot of time left. Um, but Women, Business, and the Law is really about economic opportunities for women and the equality of, of economic opportunities for women. And you cannot talk about equality of opportunity on starting a job or starting your own business when the, there are still legal differences in the world. And as, we, as I mentioned earlier, there are still over 180 countries that have some legal difference. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what we measure, because we don't measure everything. And there's probably all the countries in the world still have some legal differences in their tax rules or in different parts of the law. We are only focusing on a few uh, very narrowly defined issues, and I'll explain how we came to those issues. Um, Amanda actually was here at the beginning of this, so if you want to know why Women, Business, and the Law got started at the World Bank, she can probably answer that question. Uh, it started in 2010. Um, and it, it has been produced every two years since then. Um, over those years, of course, the, the coverage of the report changed. So it started with fewer countries, measuring just a few things, and then expanding both what is being measured and where it's being measured. Um, in 2018, we introduced a scoring, so trying to assess a quantitative measure of these questions that we were asking. And in 2019, we introduced an index that aggregated all those questions into one score per country. Um, and we are actually, as, as Amanda was saying, we're about to release a new report. It's going to come out on December 17th. I'm not ready to share the results yet, but I can give you some sneak peeks. I'll try to stay in the room. But um, the data in the 2019 report is actually the same as in the 2018 report. This data is current as of June 1st, 2017. So it's not the, the latest findings, but we should have the latest findings in about a month. Um, I think in this room and hearing from all of you a little bit before, I don't need to convince you that investing in women is smart economics. It's, it's the right thing to do. It's the morally, ethically right thing to do. Women are human beings. We don't argue over having laws that protect us from crime, from theft, from murder. And we shouldn't have to convince people that we should have laws that give women equal opportunity. Um, but besides the being the right thing to do, we do find evidence that it's also uh, has economic benefits. And so in countries where we see laws more equal, where we see more women in the workforce, we do see improved education and health outcomes, higher income per capita, faster economic growth, and, and just greater competitiveness. So we are making the economic case for this as well, because when women are empowered, they, could, they make the best decisions for themselves, for their families, and their communities, and everybody benefits. Um, with our data, we're trying to give, and I know we have a lot of data, but we still want to make that case that this is, um, there's a good business reason to do this, and it's not just because it's the right thing to do, but because we find lots of different evidence proving this. So we have looked at the economic literature to find other theoretical reasons to do this, and what are the areas to look at based on theory. We have collected this information and then correlated it with outcomes we want to influence to show that the countries that are performing better, we do see we, we see them associated with better outcomes on the ground. Um, and we've also based it on international legal frameworks like CEDA, uh, ILO conventions that really that have uh, you know have taken years to come to what are the good practices out there and we didn't want to double their work. So we are basing certain standards like um, the ideal length of maternity leave. There's lots of argument what that could be. The um, ILO has, con has kind of convened on 14 weeks, and so we've kept that as the good practice to have as a minimum. Um, these are the eight indicators that we've structured our data around, and they're structured to follow the working life of a woman. So from going out of, out of her house and being able to freely move about, to travel and, and leave the house, to starting that first job and looking at protections in the workplace that women 
um, need to have to feel safe to go to work. Uh, if men looking at getting paid, what happens when it's time to get paid? Can you work in the same jobs as men? Can you work the same hours as men? Can you work in the same industries? Like, are there laws that are protecting um, you to be paid equally with men doing the same job or equal equal type of work? Um, and then what happens when women go through certain things in their life, like getting married or having children? How does that impact their rights and their ability to come back to work after that? Um, all the way to running a business, there are countries where women cannot start a business in the same way as men. So a lot of these things are not about can women do this, but can they do it in the same way as men? And often we find differences that women have to go through additional burdens uh, to open a bank account and start their company. Um, and there's often not protection and access to credit. So we also look at discrimination and access to credit. And then an extremely important one, uh, managing assets and also women's rights to own and administer property, to inherit property equally. Uh, after their spouse dies or, the, or their um, parents die, all the way to retirement. So what happens when women want to end their working life? Are they in the same position as a man? Uh, or have they been discriminated because they have to retire earlier or not all of their working uh, career was counted because they took time off to be with their children? And this is explained in a little bit more detail, all of those, all of those areas. Um, and of course, everything is based on the law. So we're not measuring practice, just look in the books and we know that that is the first step. So there's a lot that comes to, once that law is on the books, what happens in practice. Um, this is just an example of Bolivia. I know Bolivia has been in the news recently. Uh, we had this example uh, a few months ago as well, so it wasn't on purpose. But this is just an example of what this looks like when we put the numbers to it. Um, so you see in several areas, Bolivia scores 100, which means they have all the good practices that we have identified. And there's a few where they um, score less than 100, so they're 75 and starting a job. Um, they have uh, 50 and getting paid, and that's because they still have certain restrictions on women working at night and in certain industries. Uh, on having children, I believe they don't have maternity leave of 14 weeks. Um, and then the, the getting a pension, for example, has they don't have the same retirement age as, as men. So women often can retire earlier, which is seen as a benefit, but often ends up costing them because they, they live longer. Um, and so they retire earlier, they have less carry on into retirement. And so some of the key findings of the 2019 report, which looks at not just uh, that year, but quantify this index over the 10 years that we had data for it. So we went back in time to see not only where do we stand today, but where were we 10 years ago when we when this work started. Um, and we saw that 131 economies in this 10 year period made some at least one reform. Uh, 274 reforms in fact were made, uh, which is an incredible amount of reform. Uh, and it was good to see the progress that we made in those 10 years. Um, 10 years ago when the work started, there was not one country that could score 100 on this index. In 2019, we had six countries scoring 100. So they have made progress. And to give you some of that sneak peek, we do have a new country joining the ranks uh, next year. And it just shows that we have seen a pickup in reforms in the countries that needed the most. So we've seen more reforms happening in the Middle East and North, North Africa and South Asia. But we also continue to see reforms in high income OECD countries and the countries that have really committed to making gender equality a priority, they continue to improve their laws. And we continue to look to them to see if there are things we should be adding to the index and changing it over time. Because in 10 years, we probably won't be asking those same questions. At least, I hope we're not. Um, and just looking at the regional improvement, every single region improved, which is really positive. <laughs> we're very happy to see that they went in the right direction. And you see, I mean, it's hard to see from this bar chart, but there's been um, some, some regions have improved more than others, and some had a longer, longer way to go. But uh, with the new data that we're seeing now, we do see those two last regions, South Asia, Middle East, and Africa, really paying more attention to this and changing these laws. But everyone is also improving. So comparatively, it's, we're seeing the same trend. Um, when we look at what they are reforming, so what areas of the law are countries focusing on, there's a big, dis there's a big disparity, uh, discrepancy, as I say. Um, Countries are doing different things. The most popular reforms are related to starting a job and getting married, and what's actually driving those numbers is laws related to gender-based violence, so domestic violence legislation and legislation on sexual harassment in the workplace. So we're seeing almost every year this is what countries are reforming the most, and that's just in the last 10 years. So now that we have um, 
we're actually another sneak peek of what's coming soon. We're, we're looking back to 1917. So we have gone back to 1917, all the countries, and, and reviewed how laws looked back then and how they've changed over the 50 years. And these type of laws uh, related to women, protecting women both at home and at work is something that didn't really exist 50 years ago. It's something that started recently and is continuing uh, to be a trend. Um, another popular area is related to maternity leave, paternity leave, parental leave, and protecting women when they're pregnant in their workplace. And then you see on the other end, um, these forms related to property and inheritance are the hardest ones to pass, and we see very few countries doing that. Um, we have extremely sensitive to get these laws passed, but it's very important. Uh, things like going places, we don't see a lot of reforms because in general, most countries have remote work restrictions. But when we look back to 1970, we can see a lot of countries, including uh, places in, in, in the EU that had these type of restrictions. So it's something that we are seeing a uh, few reforms now over the 10 years, but when we go back in history, a lot of countries did have uh, restrictions on women's freedom of movement, being able to choose where they live um, and leave the country on their own, of their own will. Um, another area that we've seen a lot of reform is removing restrictions to women's work. So work, uh, the, the type of industries that women can work in, the hours they can work, the type of jobs they can do. So in many countries, there are limitations of women working in construction or mining, uh, agriculture, and even when they're allowed in those industry, industries which tend to pay more, um, they cannot do all types of jobs. So they cannot work with certain machinery or they cannot work with certain products. Um, and that limits their, that limits not only their ability to work, but also once they're working, their ability to be promoted and to earn more. Because they can't access these managerial positions if they're not allowed to work on the factory floor, for example. Um, but we do see countries reforming, so in ten years from now we might see some of these laws. And that's another one on the on the countries that have introduced sexual harassment at the workplace. Uh, you see over the 10 year period, 35 countries have introduced it. And um, another 55 economies introduced legislation on domestic violence, um, which continues to be a really, really important area. And I think with the Me Too movement, we are seeing that more and more prominent everywhere. Um, this is a slide of paternity leave. So, um, forgotten to mention this, just to see some men in the room, we're not, not too many, but we have three. <laughs> uh, it's really important for men to also advocate for this, these things. Uh, and yes, and Augusta was our director for many of those reports, so he's, uh, he's very knowledgeable and a great ambassador for the work. Uh, it, is, it is important to have somebody like Augusta talking about gender equality. I think it's only slipping through our fingers. Um, but it's important for men to also, women have made huge progress in workplace. It's important for men to do the same at home. Uh, and this is why we advocate for paternity leave and having the, taking care of a newborn not just be a mother's job, but also a father's job. But also when an employer is looking to hire a woman or a man that he might think will have children, it's important for them to consider them equally and not think, well, this woman will be out for a few years because she has, she's going to have some kids. Uh, but we do see a lot of countries introducing paternity leave or parental leave that is shared. Uh, and that's very encouraging and we will continue to advocate for that. Um, so just, this is kind of the high level results over the 10 years. We have seen progress. So we had, uh, if you look at globally, all the countries and average them out, we had a gap of about 30% in, in 2009. And we see that in 2018 to 75. So it's 25% gap now. So this means that if you look at the average, women have 75% of the rights that men have, according to them, by the law. Um, it's a good increase. It's good that it's increased, but it's increased very slowly. Uh, and when we go back to 1970s, we see that that pace of change has changed. If there are different things that have happened over time, the Beijing Conference, these things, we do see an increase in um, reform of gender laws after some of the state conventions. But if we continue with this trend, it will take another 50 years to get to equal. And I think we can do better. Um, we know that the reasons are there. We're not having to police people that this is the right thing to do. It's just how does this reform happen? Why do governments choose this over the other things that they have to deal with in other countries? Um, and that's something that would be great to hear from the audience on how can we work together 
and so we know these are and again this is very narrow there's a lot of other things that are important but on these things we have clear good practices that have been agreed to by the international community the economists the academics lawyers everyone's on the same page so how can we get more countries to adopt these laws we know we know what needs to be done but we're not yet there on how it, how it can be done in a practical way um, the report and the data helps us identify the good practices and incorporate economic research to make that case, not just to the people interested in gender equality, but to those interested in economic growth and the business uh, environment of their country. And the hope is to influence reform and to really see more countries on that list of countries that have done good. Um, what's next for us, as I mentioned, in December, we will be releasing our 2020 report, which will update this data. Uh, we'll also introduce a little bit our 50-year panel of data, which we will release hopefully in February. Uh, and this is really a summary of the reforms that have taken in these areas over the last 50 years. And we hope that this data and this analysis can really solidify that economic case for reform. And we will spend more time talking to countries, going and being with country dialogue to understand for the ones who have reformed a lot. And we do have countries um, that will be reporting on in a few in a few months that have really taken this decision to reform. They have changed in, in half of the, the areas that we cover, and we want to understand how did they make that decision to do that and to expend their political capital, sometimes arguing for things that are not socially acceptable. Um, and I think the, the biggest learning that we can have is to really understand what drives this reform. And when we <coughs> see that there are periods, if we look historically, we do see that there are periods of time, decades, or certain years that have seen much more reform than others. And what happened in those years that all those countries decided to do those things? And what can we do to make that change? Thank you. Thank, you so much. Thank you so much, Tia. And I think it is wonderful to see that we have now emerging this collaborative, collective approach to really moving the dial. So I, I'd like to invite Laura and Tia and Anne and Gwen and Cynthia to come up and I'm going to moderate a discussion with the audience. I think it's fascinating also to talk about Laura's point. Well, you would expect when the data was out there, there would be change. And interestingly, women on boards, you can see that there would be, um, there actually, the Peterson Institute did a really interesting longitudinal study, they're filming this, so we just want to make sure we get everybody in. Uh, very interesting longitudinal study that my problem needs to stand here. Uh, that showed that there is a six percent higher return on investment when we have a critical mass of women on boards and in senior management. And it was I guess I was naive way back when we started the Women Business and the Law Project. I thought, oh. We were trying to do lines of credit for women in Africa, the first four women entrepreneurs. And Virginia Littlejohn, who is the brains behind the Global Banking Alliance for Women, now the Global Financial Alliance for Women, uh, had helped us come together and say there are actually impediments that go beyond just the, the factors that people think about. There are legal impediments. So if women can't own land, they can't have collateral for traditional loans. So. When starting Women Business in the Law, we thought, well, once people know the data, of course, they will change. And I think the, it is borne out that, in fact, it is a much bigger project. And part of what is so exciting, having all of these wonderful women on stage, is that we have a coalition for 2020, which we invite all of you to be part of, which is around a movement for change. And Sandy Okoro, who is the Senior Vice President of the World Bank and the uh, Legal Council, is leading <coughs> equality under the law at the bank where there will actually be loans that will be dedicated to making sure that these legal changes are embedded in country assistance strategies. So I think that's a very important advancement. And I think with a, a critical mass from a range of organizations, including the parliamentary organizations, that hopefully we will not only be able to talk about the data, and the positive impact of gender equality, but actually see it speed up significantly. So just remember, you heard it here, and uh, we are looking forward to 2020 really being a watershed year. 
So I would like to open it to the floor. Is there anybody who would like to make a comment, ask a question, and I will run. Maybe, Jim, I could ask you if someone helped me with the mics. Please, thank you. If you could identify yourself and stand up and, and turn around, Virginia, so you're captured on a film, that would be fantastic. If I had a mirror, I would uh, yes. address my <laughs> questions. A bit unorthodox. Uh, Virginia Littlejohn with Quantum Leaps. Um, I am also co-chair of the U.S. delegation for the Women's 20 of the G20 countries and also co-chair of Women's Entrepreneurship for the W20. So, Tia, looking in my mirror, I'm asking you a question. Um, I think I heard you say, and I hope I wasn't being delusional, but I think I heard you say that you might be open to adding some other indices to the WBL in 2021, is that correct? So we're always looking to improve the index, but we probably won't be able to add something that quickly. But if you have some ideas, uh, we would have to research it first, get the data, see if it meets all those criteria, and then consider it for inclusion. And okay, Virginia, so if I, could, if I could just, just yeah. add to that, the Women's 20 is maniacally focused on WBL, and many, many of the countries aligned themselves hugely around this, then try to push their governments, the G20 mm -hmm. governments, in this direction. And uh, I would like to actually enlist all of the heads of delegation to come up with issues not just relating to women's entrepreneurship, but all of the other issues that were on that PowerPoint that you had. It's really thrilling yes, no, I'd what love you to touch base with you now. Yeah. Thank you. And Thank you. it's probably worth saying, too, that there was a, a much broader set of data and things like tax, for example, mm -hmm. Tia is a global expert in tax. And we know in the US it's a big issue, the married filing jointly or separately. But Tia, you gave a very eloquent explanation to me when I asked why some of the data sets that had been gathered were not included in the new index, and perhaps it's worth just, yeah. just telling people. So as we continue to produce the index, we wanted to narrow it down to the areas that we saw the most impact. So we looked at all of the questions we collected were always based theoretically on, on things that we talked to experts on areas that mattered. But we had to look at it in a global scale. So you know, does it matter everywhere? So there are certain things that are very important in one country, but when you look at it in 190 countries, the variation wasn't there. So we looked at variation, so if this was something that was prevalent in a lot of countries, or it was something that was just affecting a region. Um, so a lot of questions dropped out because of the lack of variation, and then we did those correlations with outcomes we wanted to influence, and some of the um, information was just going in the wrong direction. And so we thought, okay, we know that this area is important, and one of that is, is in childcare. We know that that's an extremely important area to measure, but it might not be a legal restriction, or it might not be yeah. something that the law is currently affecting in a negative way because the results were just not correlating in the right direction. And so there are things that we'd like to reintroduce. So something like childcare, we want to get to the right question and see how we can put it there so that it is on the agenda of governments. Um, and there are other things as well. And so the other area that I'm really interested in, and if you have any ideas, I'm very open to listening, um, is on the implementation of the law. And so we know certain things like domestic violence legislation, you know, there's a lot of countries in Latin America that have this law in the books. It's been there for a while, and we still see that is a, a really big issue. And so the law is not going far enough. So what else needs to be there for the law to be effective? And so we really would like to learn a little bit more about the implementation part of the law and what else needs to be in place for these laws to really do what they're trying to do. Would anyone else on the panel like to comment on that issue of legal versus implementation? Well, I think it's super content. important. Mm -hmm. And I think identifying the strategies that are successful and the concert, the menu of strategies that people need to employ, um, I think uh, there's a tendency to just um, uh, make assumptions about having a law, as you said, and we don't know what the process is, what amount of public pressure is necessary, what amount of legal expertise is necessary, and then the policymakers themselves. But on the um, specific thing around domestic violence, one thing I think is really missing is a focus on the men, not the women. So, so many of these laws that we see and that I've learned about in uh, my limited travels around the world and in the United States focus on protections for women, but not on educating men not to harm women. 
Yeah, and I was just actually going to kind of thread the needle on a couple of things that were being said from sort of Laura's up until right now as well on the implementation is you also need to think, you know, having them on the books and unfortunately having worked on this issue in Africa for a very long period of time is public perception, how you're talking about things and how people are aware of all the myriad of services that is or is not available and how people are perceiving what they can do, where they can go and what happens if you do access that services within your community. And that goes back to um, not just being aware that the law exists, but that goes back to behavior change and communication issues of um, you know, the media, the role of the media, the role of the radio, the role of what is the community saying, the role of whether you will be targeted or not if you if you utilize those, those laws and those services. And it sort of comes back, Laura and I were talking before here about, about the data piece and as, as someone who, you know, built an index for women's leadership in government and it was really like data, data, data. Um, you know, it's how accessible is that? And I think one thing we need to get better about is making it really di digestible in storytelling so you can start to move people's both behavior and perceptions of, of what this means, what it's threatening, what it's not threatening in, in making some implementation issues around the world. Fantastic, thank you. And a question up the back. Yeah, hi, I'm Diana Marrero. I work at Foreign Policy Magazine, so thank you for teeing that up for me so nicely. Um, and I just returned yesterday from Reykjavik. I was uh, with many of the women on the on the panel here. Um, I have a very quick comment and then a question. So I, as I was getting back, um, I was talking to someone at the line, you know, to customs and mentioning my two children, four and seven, and um, American woman that I'm talking to, you know, we're here in one of the most powerful countries, I would say fairly equal um, society, and her question was, oh, who, who was watching your children while you were at this conference? And I said, well, I do have a husband, I have a dad, <laughs> and uh, he was watching them. And then she said, well, but um, what about, you know, does he work? I said, well, yes, but so do I. <laughs> They go to daycare and they go to school. So, you know, we have a long way to go. Um, uh, my question is about, uh, Laura, you mentioned the Norwegian example. So um, at Foreign Policy, we're actually doing quite a bit in the gender space, and we're about to release a study looking at legacy industries and the role of having women in, um, in the C-suite and uh, on boards um, uh, when it comes to performance of those companies um, in terms of ESGs. So, and we're finding a very, um, I don't know if I'm gonna ca call it a correlation or causation, or our researchers are doing that and we're trying to be careful about how we categorize the data, but we are definitely seeing a relationship between having more women at the top and those companies' performance when it comes to ESGs. And so I was really curious if you could talk a little bit more about the Norwegian experience and if, if that's been replicated in other countries. Um, it's not something that I'm aware that our researchers are looking at. We were looking more at the corporate versus the um, government um, kind of foundation for that um, for that change. Right, well, it, it, I, I'll be interested in your research around the ESG, it doesn't surprise me uh, as you're describing it, uh, just based on what I said about the Norwegian, that the women are more interested in the stakeholder issues. You know. uh, the, uh, no, so this was on corporate boards, so it was the private sector, right? No, not, not the public sector. The private sector, this was, yeah, corporate boards kind of thing. Um, and uh, there, more and more countries are putting affirmative mechanisms onto corporate boards. Okay. Five, I'd say, yeah, yeah, I've quite a few now. Lots, lots. Yeah. Who? Yeah, so. Edge, economic. Oh, Edge, edge. yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Edge, yeah, yeah. Um, Klaus Schwab's daughter, yeah. The sustainable account, yeah, standards boards are in. So I think they're, 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 that that's quite directional. In fact, you know, this would get a little bit on my own particular belief, uh, which is is that you know the the U.S. keeps falling further and further behind on the World Economic Forum gender gap report. You know, right? We were at 12, 13, or something. And now we're at 77, and yeah, we just keep falling further and further. Not because we're getting worse. Be but because everyone else is improving, and they're improving basically because embedded within the corporate and the public sector, et cetera, are these affirmative mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That affirmative mechanism issue is a really important one, and I recently learned from Cynthia that of the top 50 countries that have the highest representation of women in politics, there are 82% 
projects that have either quotas or temporary special measures. And if we have time, or for those of you who have time to stay for a couple of minutes, we'll show you the video on this. But it is fascinating to see how the evidence base backs up on yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. And Pippa Norris from the Kennedy School do, does similar research around this. And she found at the time, and maybe this has changed slightly, but that there were only two exceptions. Uh, that with the two exceptions, all parliaments got to critical mass only with some sort of affirmative mechanism in place. Wow. Now, in, for your own research, I would suggest a man named Aaron Deer, D-H-I-R, who has a book called Homogeneity in the Boardroom uh, for, for that. But the th thing about Norway is it's the longest running affirmative mechanism in place. It's the first. Right. One final question before we wrap up, because as you've seen from the seating arrangement, there is another event at 2 o'clock straight after us. So any last burning? Perfect. Then I'm going to ask Anne the question of why this is important for Thunderbird and why is gender equality something that needs to be on the radar screen for all these brilliant students who are mid-career professionals? Thanks. Um, I want to answer that with a story. And the story is actually the story of a woman who was in the first cohort of the master's program I ran in Singapore that is in many way, ways a model of what Thunderbird is going to be doing in Washington. And she was an executive at, well, I can name them because they gave me permission, Diageo, which as you know is a, an alcohol company. And Diageo is prides itself on how well it treats its women, its own employment practices, gender equality within the corporation. So when they decided that they were going to undertake a major corporate social responsibility initiative, they said, it's all going to be about gender and women's rights, and we're going to go out and empower lots and lots and lots and lots of women all over Asia, because this was their Asia-based program. And then they discovered reality, which is that this is a much, much more complex mm -hmm. set of issues than running a corporation. Um, which I think feeds back into much of what we are talking about because the kind of management that we need to train people in is dealing with the complexities that are much more extreme than the complexities that a business faces. A business gets to optimize around a very few, very small number of things. Dealing with the kinds of issues that we're talking about is a much more difficult thing to do. So they tried all sorts of things. Do you have any idea whose phone that is? Um, um, oh, that's an important one. Um, so they tried all sorts of different things, and much of it was not working. What they finally ended up doing was partnering with a major international development NGO and working in one region of one developing country in Asia, where they discovered that the biggest barrier to making progress for women in that region was the legal barriers the kinds of things that you're talking about. They could not inherit, they could not ha access credit, um, et cetera, et cetera. So they embedded themselves in that region for several years, built up relationships of trust, and over time got that local area to change the nature of the laws and thereby make it possible for all the other things that also have to happen. But they could only do this by embedding themselves for several years. So I think this is the other side of the implementation question you have to have the top-down changes in laws. You, you cannot do without that. But if you want to get the full-scale implementation of those changes, you also need this bottom-up, broader involvement. And there are parts of the private sector that can be your ally in doing this. Fantastic. Thank you. We have one very last question from Ali. OK, good. Thank you. Ali Bird. Um, I'm with Life Pieces to Masterpieces, which is here in the district working with young boys and men east of the Anacostia River um, to preparing them to transform their own lives and their neighborhoods. And I'm always struck in when we have in America, we have discussions of global development. And I've learned so much today. This has been wonderful um, that we assume that America is a developed country. And for thousands upon thousands and thousands of poor women in this country, it's not a developed country. They still can't, if you live in public housing, you can't get access, you can't, you can't work beyond a certain amount, you can't have a husband, you can't have a, a man in your house, in your, in your housing. So we are in the same situation as women around the world. And I just, I always note that because it's, I think we forget. Thank you, Ali. I think that's a wonderful note on which to close.
because in fact, this is about a global solidarity, a sisterhood, and the brotherhood. <laughs> so everybody working together to bring about change so that we are all able to realize our highest, best selves, and that for our communities and societies. So thank you so much, everybody, for participating and being with us today. We're right on time at quarter to two. We are going to show one of the short videos that we're working on with the parliamentarians about the laws. It's out of date now that Tia, it's a draft, because now that Tia has told us where we're moving with things. But for those of you, as you're packing up, you might just like to glance up at the screen. And please join me in thanking our two keynotes, uh, Laura and Tia, and our wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's amazing how time flies when there's all this brilliance in the room. That was great. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. It's just great. It was, yeah, yeah, she said. Oh, what a great idea. Yes, that's right. I, I managed to tweet, but we will get a photograph of Great idea. Yes. Uh, we'll put the first one on of the laws. We'll do the laws first. Just play it. And we'll put the... All United Nations member states made the commitment in 2015 to ensure women's full and effective participation and equal opportunities for leadership. Back in 1990, the United Nations Economic and Social Council recommended targets for increasing women's leadership to 30% by 1995 and to parity by 2000. These targets are based not just on reasons of equity and fairness in representation, but also because it makes for stronger governance and better bottom line outcomes. While it is more challenging to grapple with different perspectives, the diversity dividend is well documented. In the private sector, more women in managerial positions and on boards correlates with increased return on investment. In governance bodies, more women included correlates with increased emphasis on long-term growth drivers like education and health. So with such a strong case for equal representation, what's the current state of play? Disappointingly, by 2020, just 2% of UN member states reached gender parity in their parliaments. And only one in four has reached the 30% target originally set for 1995. And less than 7% of country leaders are women. In the private sector, Almost one-third of companies globally have no women at all in either board or C-suite positions. So with progress this slow, how do we know what works? Research shows gender quotas are the strongest factor influencing women's legislative representation, and women who benefit from quotas are shown to be just as qualified as men. The data reveals that 82% of countries in the top 50 for women's political representation have some form of quota or temporary special measure to nominate women candidates. In the private sector, women's representation on boards has increased significantly with the introduction of quotas. Political systems seem to matter too. The data shows that 75% of nations in the top 50 for women's political representation have a proportional or mixed voting system. So what can you do to make a positive difference as an individual parliamentarian? First, it's impossible to make meaningful progress without knowing the current state of women's representation. So please ask for the data. Second, you can remind colleagues of your government's commitment to SDG 5 to ensure women's full and effective participation and equal opportunities for leadership. Third, you can support the adoption and enforcement of quotas or temporary special measures for both national and local government and for women on boards. Fourth, advocate to adopt proportional voting systems as women are more likely to be elected than in majoritarian systems. Fifth, advocate for modern legislative norms such as on-site childcare, adequate toilet facilities, nursing rooms and paid parental leave so all parliamentarians, both women and men, can fulfill family responsibilities. Finally, you can commit today to act as a mentor and guide to help ensure more women run for office.
You as a parliamentarian can make a real difference to more effective governance in your country by taking action on at least one proven measure to advance women's equality. It's time to act. What will you commit to today?